Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the Fit Lawyer Pod. I am your host, Fit Lawyer Julia, which is my Instagram handle, but you know, my name's Julia, <laughs> in case that wasn't clear. But um, yeah, today I had a very, very special guest. She is one of my best friends from middle school. We met in the eighth grade. I was the new girl in class, and she was Queen B of the girl group who generously invited me to hang out with them in class and subsequently sit with them for lunch, which is a big freaking deal, okay? As the new girl for the third time in in two years in middle school, um, yeah, you, you need someone to invite you to lunch and, and sit with you in class. And Courtney did just that. Um, I have so many, so many beautiful memories with Courtney and so many experiences that I would not have been able to have without her. Um, you know, I spent my first Christmas with her family. I think that was in the ninth grade. Um, I'm not going to tell you what year it is cause I don't want to date myself, but, um, yeah. So, you know, my, my first Christmas with her as well as so many concerts, um, which we will discuss whether it was just the solo band up in Portland or going to warp tour and mosh pitting and crowd surfing. Yes, your girl did that. Um, and just all of the times we've had together as well as kind of um, where our our paths more separated a little bit more after high school, we went to different schools, really kind of just pursued different things in life. Um, you know, she was in a 12 year relationship pretty much from when she was like 17 to, to 30 um, and you know, she was in that relationship for all of her twenties, <clears throat> which we will discuss. Um, and as well as her careers, she had a career change also in her mid to late twenties. She went back to school, um, to, to pursue that career, moved out of state. So did a lot of really, how do I want to say it? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're life changing events, but took a lot of leaps of faith, right? Moving to another country, moving to another state to go to school to pursue a career change. You know, that's, that's very terrifying. Um, ex and as well as leaving her, her family and her then boyfriend. But as you'll hear her say, it is the best decision she's ever made. And it, helped her grow up a lot and helped her introspect on what she really wants in life, both professionally and personally. Um, currently, she is happily living and engaged in McMinnville, Oregon. She is in the field, um, the industry that she went to school in and finally in a role that matches her education level. Um and, and I, I, I just, I love her so much and I just feel so blessed to have her in my life and to have known her for almost 20 years. Cause again, you know, I'm, we met in middle school and we're in our early thirties. So yeah, so it's definitely been almost 20 years and I think that's very rare and she's just such a beautiful soul and you'll hear me, um, apologize to her because there was definitely a time where I sent some pretty cruel things in a text message that were uncalled for. Um, and I don't want to brush that, um, underneath the rug. You know, what I, what I said was not okay. And I'm just so happy and so thankful that she has forgiven me for that. She has accepted my apology for that. Um, of course, before this episode, I, I did apologize to her privately after I sent the text message. So, you know, we're on really good terms, but I, if anything, for me, I can't speak for her, but for me, that 
that brought me closer to her, or at least like I, I feel closer because it's like, hey, thank you for accepting the fact that I'm not a perfect person and I'm not a perfect friend. And thank you for accepting my apology um, when when I came to my senses, you know, like I, I, I don't expect my friends to be perfect either. Um, but if it's a genuine apology, then of course, like, I think friendships are, are not easy. Like anything and like any other relationship, they take work, they take understanding and, and they take forgiveness. Um, so I am very, very happy to still have Courtney in my life, to still have her love, to still have her friendship. And I just genuinely enjoyed our conversation so, so much. So without further ado, my best friend from middle school, here's Courtney. Okay. Well, that means we're live. Yay! And thank you so much for uh, agreeing to come on and chit chat with me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I feel like it's been so long. You don't have an iPhone, so we never get to FaceTime. I, you know what? I used to not have an iPhone, but I have an iPhone now. So now oh, I'm, nice. I just don't, I'm just one of those millennials who struggle with keeping up with technology. I feel like I'm. Oh, me too. <laughs> no, me too. Like sometimes when I'm talking to like the Gen Zers, I'm like, dang, you, you only a few years younger than me, but why you make me feel so old? Like, but I think I it's also funny. Have you seen uh TikTokers in the wild? Like, so I'm not even on TikTok. <laughs> no, I'm not on TikTok either, but I, I not, like, oh, okay. like TikTokers in the wild, like sometimes I'll be walking banded or if I'm doing something and then you'll see one person recording and then the other person just doing like weird shit. So I assume they're oh, filming a TikTok. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have seen that like in hotels, you see that and people that are doing tours and stuff. It's, I, I, I bet you see it a lot in San Diego though, because it's so pretty down there and the weather's good and yeah. How was Florida? <laughs> So Florida was good. Yes. So I went over there um, about a week, visited my parents. Uh, you know, you out of all people know that that was, uh, you know, a very tumultuous relationship growing up and stuff. Um, but yeah, I'll save that for a different episode. This episode yeah. is about you. So we have Miss Courtney Lynn on right now and she is currently in Oregon. Um, I've known Courtney since middle school, like what, 13 years, thir like I'm 30. Lock oh my time. God. That's I almost have. 20 years. I know. Almost 20 years. <laughs> and, um, you know, so we went to middle school together. I went to three middle schools in two years. It was a shit show. I was, you know, if, as of being the new girl isn't hard enough, I feel like middle school is definitely one of like the hardest years to be the new girl. And so when I transfer from Patton to Dunaway, um, you know, I'm just so glad I found you and, and your girl crew of four and you, <laughs> <laughs> you allowed I me. I just remember that you went to Patton first until now. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was kind of the rivalry. You either went to one school or you went to the other. And so... That I'm sure that was difficult, like not really understanding that culture and then coming yeah. into it. Like, what is this rivalry? <laughs> well, also, like I moved from the Bay Area. So when I moved from the Bay Area where there was like tons of schools, I went to McMinnville and there were only two middle schools. And I picked Patton first because they were the Patton Mustangs. And then before when I was in California middle school, our mascot was also the, the Mustang. So I was like, oh. It's an easy transition. We're both yeah. horses. And then <laughs> I was just kind of bullied there pretty relentlessly. So my mom was like, if you want us to put you in the other middle school, we can. But after this, you're you're kind of out of options. There's only two schools here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so. I never really um, embraced the wine culture before. And then now that I'm like in hospitality, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying my, my hardest to... <laughs> Yeah, you look. What, what are you drinking right now? This is um, I don't even know. I, I know it's Argyle. I don't know if they're like they're Ooh, I like Argyle. Just sparkling, yeah, sparkling wine from Argyle. Um, Ooh. Open it. Nice. <laughs> He's in the other room. <laughs> I mean, you live in one of like the best wine countries in the world. I did not know that either. Uh, maybe because we were kids, and you know, we weren't illegally drinking. <laughs> 
Right, right. I do remember, uh, though, you, I remember you liking wine. I remember you, I remember we were, like, probably 16. <laughs> and I came over one time, and you were drinking red wine out of a mug, and you were like, it's good for your heart, and, like, part of my culture <laughs> to drink wine is, like, good for you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I, cause, yeah, because my parents used to buy those uh, wine boxes. <laughs> The really cheap ones. So it's like if I stole a, a mug, they're not going to know because the wine's in a freaking cardboard box. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it was way easy to, to sneak news with my parents. And plus, you knew that they worked so much that they were pretty oblivious to my life as long as like my grades were good. You know, that's why I was like a little orphan. <laughs> I, I didn't understand it at the time um, because my life's my family's lifestyle was so different but now in hospitality i i understand like that's it's a lot of work to keep yeah. running yeah speaking of your family how um how are your parents and your brother good um i so i don't i can't get mail at this location where i'm at right now so i still send my packages and amazon <laughs> orders and all that to my parents house my yeah. mom loves it, of course. She's like, so if you, you buy stuff, you have to come over and see me. I get to <laughs> so I was just over there picking up my packages not too long ago and got to see them. And they let me, uh, they let me vent about work, which is needed. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, I want to get to that later, but um, just a little background. I actually spent my very first American Christmas with Courtney uh, uh, I, was it eighth grade or high school? I think it was freshman year. Was it freshman was year? It? Yeah, because eighth grade we met and we were friends. And, you know, I, I I was the new girl. And then I slowly became part of your little girl, girl group. There were four. Then there was five. And then, you know, slowly we were that number to a need of a cool Asian chick. <laughs> um, I, I think you were just super sweet. You saw that I didn't really have any friends. And we had quite a few classes together. Um, so I don't really remember how it all happened, but it felt very, very natural. You know, I had a few classes with the other girls, but you were just extra warm and extra inviting and Aww. leader leader of the pack. So if you said I was in, they couldn't say shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, yep, yep. Um, so I spent my first American Christmas with you, and that was, you know, I, I think that really um, put you and your family in a very special place in my heart because I will, you know, that's, that was so oh. memorable, you know, waking up and, and opening presents for the first time. And, you know, even though we were in middle school or high school, I knew, even though I said it from Santa, I knew your parents bought them. <laughs> <laughs> but it yeah. was still very cute. Yeah, that was special for us too. Yeah. And, um... You know, throughout the rest of high school, we also um, did high school football managing together. That was a time. We did. Yes. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, you know, going to um, all the different games and traveling. I think that's what really bonded um, us three because there was, uh, we had we had three girls who was football managing and um, the other girl's dad was one of the coaches. Um it's really kind of crazy to think about that that was 15. it was such a vibe too because it felt like a job in a lot of ways like it felt yes. like we were working but we were also just gossiping and growing up <laughs> and thing and just like processing life in school and all of that and sometimes even recorded I feel like we were like the OGs of podcasts because we were <laughs> recording ourselves while we were recording the football games and practices and then the coaches would have the volumes turned up and be like girls you can't oh talk about gosh <laughs> Yes, that's right. We used, to, in addition to giving out water during the games, we will also film their practice. And it wasn't until later that they told us they listened to that shit with the volume on. But it's like, why? You're just looking at the plays. You just want to hear us girls talk shit. Yeah, we uh, we got into trouble a couple times. For yeah, that. but I do wonder what Luke Book is doing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm legal now, sir. 
Okay. Yeah, no, for but for real though, I I still do wonder what he's doing. And for reference, uh, Luke Luke Fook <laughs> was one of our football coaches. He was probably the youngest guy, or him and Micah were probably close in age. Yeah, um, but he was definitely one of the younger guys, and he, he was. I don't know what else to say. He was fine, and he was like in his late twenties. <laughs> we were teenagers. He was in his late twenties. He was tall. He was fit. He was the weightlifting coach. The boys loved him. Like all the football players loved him. Yeah, well, and it was it was funny too because everybody knew about um, his prom story. Yes, he would. He so I think he, he was on the news or something. He went on some talk show host, some talk show to talk about that. I can't yeah. remember if it was one of the Jimmys or the late nights, but um, yeah, he got quite a bit of clout from that. He took like seven, seven or eight girls to the prom. Yeah, just <laughs> one rose for all of them and one limo to fit them all. You know what's funny? I, society has changed so much that I feel like that wouldn't be glorified today. I feel like that would be seen as like misogynistic. It would definitely be some sister vibe, like, sister no, wives but... vibe yeah. type. I mean, it's uh, it's all it's always goes both ways, right? If anything, I think he might have just like blown up and gotten even more clout. Just you know gotten straight up famous off that girl mm-hmm. sliding his dms and and all stuff after that because back in his day they couldn't really reach him even if he you know even after he did go on national television and, and stuff yeah but um and then kind of after that after high school we kind of uh went our own separate ways i went to university of oregon you went on to be a wife for the price of a girlfriend. I love how you put that. Yeah. Yeah, I did do that. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that relationship, yeah. but um, that I learned that term when I was living with my ex from one of my friends, um, one of my bodybuilding friends. She's about 10 years older, kids, marriage, divorce. So she's, she's you know, walk the walk. And that's what she used to tell me all the time. She's like, Julia, I know you're in love, but I'm letting you know now that you're doing the job of a wife for the price of a girlfriend. Um, Because with my ex, I used to, you know, wake up the same time as him in the morning, make him breakfast while he got ready for work, packed his lunch. And it really very much so was the the, the job of a wife for the the price of a girlfriend. Um, And you were in that relationship for... 12 years basically from when you were what 16 17 all of your 20s and through your 30 or your I mean your 30 right yeah and you know we had very we yeah after high school was very different experiences for both of us you got to go you know kind of figure out how to be a grown-up and (laughs) you know and do that and I sort of I don't know it was, a, it was definitely a choice. I don't feel like, I don't know. It was, it was just like, it felt like the natural path, I guess. Um, yeah. But I, with that said, I never really got to figure out who I wanted to be. I knew who, yeah. I, who I was and who I, I felt ex- expected to be, but I never really got to figure out what that felt like for, for me. Um, yeah. But, and then I did. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit older. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, I was, I have not been in a relationship that long. Both my relationship with my uh, first boyfriend in high school, as you know, lasted about two years. And with my last relationship, it lasted about two years. And after college or after high school, I did the pretty traditional route. I went to University of Oregon, moved in with some friends, with some classmates um, but I'm I'm very curious on kind of um, your post high school experience because at that time you were with your then boyfriend for about two years and then you uh, went to community college and then college. But during that time, you guys also moved around quite a bit, right? Before um, you guys settled in in Sheridan. So um, yeah, just share with us kind of your journey after um, high school before settling down in, in Sheridan? Yeah. Um, 
So I did. I went to community college for two years and gosh, I, um, I moved around so much. I'm trying to remember that far back. Um, I think at that time when I was going to Chemeketa, mm-hmm. I was living with my parents and it might've been a sort of a combination between like living between his parents and my parents. Okay. Um, but I think we were still very much like put in the door with our folks. Um, Gosh, and back then, this is how much of a late bloomer I really was, too, because I didn't, you don't ever remember me driving in high school. Oh, I didn't, yes. I didn't actually become a licensed driver until I was 19. Yes. And um, <laughs> so Courtney what, what, did I was get her license. With you. <laughs> I was just about to say, I, I may have contributed to that because when I first got my license, I can't even remember where we were going, but uh, I definitely T-boned somebody and totaled both cars at 16 with Courtney in the passenger side. But what was fucking annoying is that we were literally down the street from your house. I know. I was like, ah, so close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was unpleasant. Yeah, but... uh <laughs> I've only totaled two cars after that, so <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> if if we space out all the t- cars I've totaled by the number of years I've been driving, it's not that bad, okay? Well, okay. It's cheers to being your first. <laughs> that was my first car accident, too, so <laughs> at least we got to uh, lose our, our car crash virginities together at, yeah. at 16. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Sorry if that cost you some... <laughs> PTSD and delaying uh, <laughs> you getting your license. She had, she, and your dad really wanted you to get your license because he bought you a car and then I don't know if you didn't like that one or whatever, and then he got you another one. Homie bought me three cars before I even had a driver's license. <laughs> My dad, yeah. he, uh... he, I think that was his way of like motivating you, right? Like he was yeah. like, hey, like, get your freaking license yeah you know it it, well it really is a testament to how much i just wasn't ready to grow up um i think like looking back it's probably not how i felt at the time but i just wasn't ready i wasn't ready to be that responsible i wasn't ready to have that so i kind of stayed at home and you know i milked it for as long as i could (laughs) yeah um do you think do you think at that, you said, you know, I wasn't ready to grow up. So do you think because you weren't super ready, you kind of just, you know, maybe followed your then partner instead of being like, hey, this is what I want to do. This is the path I want to go. Because you're in hospitality now and you actually got your graduate degree in hospitality. But I had, but, you know, when I was in high school, when we were at high school and my parents, um, you know, had the hotel in, in, in McMinnville. I had no idea that that was a field that you were interested in. Yeah, no. Uh, and I, it wasn't at the time. I, it's exactly how you described it. I didn't really have a sense of direction, so I just kind of relied on, you know, okay, I guess this is where my life is going, and I guess this is what I'm doing. You know, and I don't, I, I don't have regrets, but I just I didn't have a clear vision of what I really wanted out of life or out of anything, a career path. Um, I sort of didn't even know that I wanted to go into mental health. Um, That was kind of an offshoot of my undergrad degree, which is human development and family science is what my my undergraduate degree is actually Mm -hmm. in. Um, And Mm -hmm. I just sort of fell into mental health because of, you know, relatively, you know, related. But no, I didn't even have a clear vision of what school I wanted to go to. I just knew that that's where he wanted because of the, the programs. And I just sort of went with it and was passive about, you know, my entire life. <laughs> until until I sort of figured out what I wanted, you know. Yeah. So just kind of recap. After community college, you transferred to uh, Oregon State. And because that was the school that your then partner was was going to so like you said it was kind of like okay well you know we're we've been together for this many years to you it it, it was just kind of a very matter-of-factly thing like this is my partner I've been with him for this many years probably the rest of my life it just makes sense that I transferred to Oregon State because 
that's where he's going. They have a, you know, decent program. And it was kind yeah. of just like, okay, like, In am the, I understanding that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry to cut you off. Um, that's exactly how I just didn't really, I was, I was just sort of waiting for direction from him, I suppose. I sort of took a, yeah. a backseat to, you know, the decision making. Um, which is, it's, it's, was fine. I didn't, you know, I, if I would have thought about where I wanted to go, it just seems like the, it seems like it was either Oregon state or university of Oregon. Those were like where we were going to end up. Yeah. Um, and so after that, how long did you work in the, uh, mental health field and, and kind of what, what did you do, um, in your role? during that time? Yeah. Um, well, I can even go back before that when we were still in college because you sort of mentioned earlier, sorry, this is kind of all over the place, um, but you had mentioned earlier about moving around a lot. Yes. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of moving when, I, when we were still an undergrad, um, mainly for my ex-partner's uh, internship programs. Mm -hmm. So we had moved up to the Portland area um, for six months, moved back to uh, Corvallis, and then moved back to Portland again um, a handful of times just for various internship, you know, situations for him. Um, and I just sort of found odd jobs um, along the way while I was still in school. Um, and that's sort of where I started to find my niche was w working with people in the different jobs that I the, like jobs that I thought were fun. Um, I worked in a sporting goods store for the same company for three years and got to transfer um, to different oh, locations nice. there. But then, um, but then after that, I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to move to sort of the Portland area where there's, you know, might be more different opportunities for me to just have a job. So I, I, at the time I was really, YouTube was taking off and I was super into um, like YouTube cosmetics and the, the makeup culture and community that I was like, I'm going to go get this job uh, working at the makeup counter at uh, Macy's. And that was really fun for a while, too. I got to kind of explore my creativity. Fun. Yeah, when I was in college, that was fun. And so that inspired me a little bit. I was like, maybe I want to go into something creative. Maybe I want to do something artistic. Um, but that's also kind of a scary thought when you're spending so much money on education in mm -hmm. one way to kind of, so I was like, ah, I've already sort of committed to, to human development and family science. I'm going to stick to this and at least, you know, finish in this. And then maybe we can see where it goes. Um, so we graduated and then moved back. How did we get back to this area from Corvallis? I think moved back in with my folks, probably part-time my folks, part-time his folks. Um, for a while before we got a place. Timeline's kind of fuzzy, but um, I started. It's working. okay. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I, know, I know. Anyway, I started working. Um, before I started, um, I started working in crisis and respite. Um, for Yamho County. Um, what is that? So you started working. Can you repeat that? Crisis, crisis and respite. Crisis and respite, and what is that? So. <laughs> It, it's a job in like the mental health field okay and specifically working with individuals um, that were in mental health crisis or they needed like somewhere to stay um, and either get clean or you know get some services for a few days so we, it, it was a residential um, setup that we monitored okay. we did medication monitoring um, helped with errands helped with jobs things like that it was kind of a a very unique job to have right out of college um, yeah I, in scary I dealt with yeah. scary situations <laughs> um and I was like tw what 23 and I was you know all of a sudden had very very strong responsibilities for the people that I was serving communities that I was working with what um, would be sorry uh what would be considered a mental health crisis um it's so vague right yeah, because sometimes I feel like I have those twice a day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know what is the professional standard yeah. 
um, of, of what is considered a crisis versus just like, hey, I, I you know, because. That's a great question. No, um, a lot of the times it would be like there would already be an established rapport with some of the individuals um, that had like grown up or had learned how to cultivate or I don't, I don't know how I want to put this. So I'm trying to be PC too. Uh, okay, let me, I need to think of a segue how to get this back on track too. Help me out, Julia. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess for me, like, I, I want to understand this because everybody nowadays, especially with like social media and YouTube university, as they call it, everybody feels qualified to, to diagnose someone, right? Like, that person's toxic, that person's a narcissist, that person's bipolar, that person's, you know, antisocial or whatever. Like, absolutely. I just think nowadays, like, you know, again, with with social media and YouTube University, everybody feels qualified to diagnose someone. I was a psychology major. And that's, that's my degree from undergrad, but I'm not going to go around diagnosing people like, I think everything is on a spectrum, right? Like if, if someone's really confident, somebody might look at them and be like, yo, they're so self-confident. I'm, I'm so um, in admiration of them as I am with some of my bodybuilding friends or some of my friends who are Instagram models who have over 100,000 followers who post very sexy pictures. But then again, some people might be like, that bitch is such a narcissist. Why does she need to post her tits and ass on Instagram all day? Or like, damn, like, you know, like, like, whatever. Um, so I guess. Okay. No, I, I absolutely. And I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I was never diagnosing. I, so basically they would call us in for support. Um, okay. if, if somebody was with our therapist, and okay. we often like drove them to appointments and things like that. So let's say a situation would be that I was um, working with um, a client and drove them to their therapy appoint appointment. Um, mm -hmm. They would the therapist would often make recommendations for um, skills training, things that that, that they would you okay. know challenge them with, you know. And then we would be like the helpers. We would assist them if um, let's say the therapist had recommended that they went to the library. Um, okay. time. like we would just be their support person. Okay. So you worked with the individuals, but also the therapist in how to, or, or what to do with this specific individual. So you received instructions so, from their therapists. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And how long were you doing that? Um, I think I did crisis and respite for a year to two years. And it took me into another field where I started working at um, a facility with 15 residents. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think. And then what was your role? What, what was your, what was the second role? At the facility? And, yeah. Um, skills trainer. And, um, oh, what did they call me? A uh, caseworker. Okay. My so yeah, I guess I was so, sort of like a caseworker. So what did you do in, in, in that role that was different than, than your previous role? Um, it was not as intense. I only worked with adults, um, individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, and they also had a co-occurring um, medical issue. That's okay. how they met criteria to live there. Um, medical issue like... Uh... Like, like diabetes a lot is of, hard. A lot like, of it was like older people. Okay. Older okay. people with like older, old, older people conditions. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, or they've been, or they had been court mandated, mandated to live there. Okay. Um, I know it's very confusing. <laughs> this just shows the holes in the mental health system as it like becomes hard to explain what actually my job was and what I was responsible for um, yeah. because that overlaps so much, especially when you're working with people who have a team, like it's mm -hmm. great to have wraparound services where there is somebody supporting people. But when those roles get intertwined, it's like, okay, you know, 
And that's, that's part of the reason why I left. It got so difficult to create boundaries after, especially the second um, place that I was working, uh, talking about in the facility, because you're working directly in their home. You know, okay. that's inside that's the they, patient's they, home. They, yeah. They, because they, they live, live there. there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I guess I, I asked so many questions because um, for most of my legal career, I was a labor and employment uh, attorney. So I work with plaintiffs. I spoke with many people about their jobs, their roles. And there's so many um, like job, like not even just jobs, but industries that hasn't even crossed my mind. Um, and then as I speak to, you know, these all these individuals, probably thousands, and learn about their job, their background, their grievances, because by the time they're talking to me, they're not happy about their job, right? Right, right. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm always so curious and learning about different industries and the different flaws that, that can really only be known by people in the industry. And kind of like what, you know, you were explaining just now, like the fact that, that, you know, everything's so intertwined and a little bit overlapped, but also there's still so many holes, you know? Oh, so many holes. Yeah. Um, and especially in such a, like, specifically a crisis and respite, like a lot of the time we're dealing with people that are yeah. suicidal. Like my scariest times that I had, my most intense, scariest interactions were suicidal individuals who had, you know, made attempts. So being like, 23 and not knowing yeah. like what I'm actually responsible for, like, and knowing like what, you know, what did I do to contribute to this leading to this? Because in this particular situation that I'm thinking about, um, the person that the, the client that was staying with us had test positive for drugs at the time it was marijuana, which at the time wasn't legal yet. Mm -hmm. So we, they weren't allowed to stay there. Oh shit! For a little, for a little bit of weed, yeah, right. Yeah, shit. <laughs> Considering all the other things that they had been doing and were, you know, yeah. still. So, um, basically, what happened in that situation was that um, we were going to have to tell her that she wasn't allowed to be um, housed with us anymore. Um, and went to talk to my team for five minutes. Came back to her room, and she had, you know, made a suicide attempt. Or Unalive. Can I say suicide? I'm not sure if I can say suicide. Yeah. She tried to unalive herself. Say whatever the fuck you want, girl. It's my <laughs> podcast. It's my platform. If they want to take me down, they can take me down. But okay. yes, this is this is a free reign. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, that was the first time I've ever really been exposed to something that traumatic. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was my job, so I sort of was like, okay, I take responsibility for this situation because this is what I signed up for. But at the right. same time, I'm like, I don't know how to deal with this. Right. I'm not equipped to handle, you know, blood and all this. That was a lot. What kind of um, training do they give you guys at the clinic? Because they can't realistically expect someone, uh, you know, a fresh young grad with a degree to, to, to handle all of this. So what kind of training did they provide? Um but beforehand, before they put you in, in these roles and gave you these responsibilities? Um, there was, tra there was training. There's actually, I, I will say the county does a, a very good job of documenting probably for the reason of where you would come in for a reason of showing, you know, this is the training that they've <laughs> received. Um, there were videos and we did, um, I don't think when I worked in crisis and respite, there was nonviolent crisis intervention training, but definitely when I worked in the facility that I worked at, there were, um, like self-defense classes okay. that were the, um, basically how, how to not fight back, but to protect yourself. Um, and that was helpful, but I don't think besides a lot of meetings, I don't think that there was a lot of, it was a lot of like, how do we unpack this as a team after this has happened? Okay. As opposed to like preventative, like, cause I don't, we have, we have, we have indications of behavior that's predictable, right? Especially working with individuals that we have rapport with. Um, but nobody ever really knows how somebody's going to behave. Yeah. And how of to prepare for something like that. Um, so a lot of it, 
a lot unfortunately a lot of it was just on the job like how to how to how to build up yeah. um a barrier for your own mental state when you're dealing with yeah. that how long were you working in the mental health industry um, in total before you went and got your uh, graduate degree and, and uh, career change? Um, good question. I want to say five to six years. That's pretty long. Yeah. That's that's pretty long. Yeah, and between then, the two um, days between the two different roles, I think it was five to six years. Um, and then you, so after that, you took uh, quite a leap of faith and going all the way out to NOLA. I'm, I'm wearing um, the NOLA. Yes, I, I'm wearing the NOLA yeah. uh, crew okay. neck I got when I went, there with you for Halloween of 2019. So Courtney yeah. uh, went to NOLA a few, I think maybe once or twice before that. And then I, I was not working at that time. And then me and the guy who then I ended up dating was not going through a good phase. So uh, you invited me out to NOLA and then I went and we had such a good time. You introduced me to the music, the culture, Bourbon Street. Uh, you <laughs> let me third wheel in your hotel room. Uh, and that was that was really fun. I love NOLA. And I think it's because how much you love NOLA. <laughs> like, <laughs> it just reminds me, like, whenever I think of New Orleans now, it just reminds me of you, reminds me of, Halloween that we had there and because like I don't really drink that much anymore like I always say I'm retired from the party scene but that was so much fun and I think I, I genuinely think it was um you know because of you and 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 that experience we had together because it wasn't just like us and Nola it was like Halloween it was extra uh extra litty <laughs> It certainly was, yeah. So uh, when was when was your first trip there, and then what made you fall in love with the city and ultimately start school there? Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> so with all this, the stress that came with the career that I had chosen, yeah, along with you know not really having a clear idea of my future and like what I really wanted, I just found myself aging and not really <laughs> knowing what I was doing. And like, I had to be like, is this really, it, what do I want? Is this what I yeah. want? And I remember I was, when I had decided I was going um, down there on vacation, I was in the bathtub, probably drinking wine. <laughs> and I had remembered that I had just had a conversation with the gal who did my hair. Her name is Jamie. And I had a phone number and I just texted her and I was like, my birthday is coming up. I'm not doing anything. Do you want to do, do you want to go on a solo trip with me to, well, I guess it would be a duo trip, but to New Orleans. A girl's trip. A girl's trip. A girl's trip. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. my birthday, I want to celebrate my birthday in New Orleans. She was like, yeah, let's do it. I love that. And that's how, that's how I wound up there. Um, gosh, I, I wonder, I wonder what inspired, you know what I think inspired it from jump was, um, American Horror Story Coven. Season okay. three, seven, where they have the New Orleans witches and the voodoo. And I'm, okay, this is, you know. So a little you know, background. Like our movies, yes. Like so background on Courtney. So yeah. background on Courtney. She loves spooky season. <laughs> she loves like ghosts, goons, goblins, and eggnog. Uh, so every year <laughs> in high school, she would force us to drink eggnog, even though I fucking told her I don't like eggnog. Dog. It has not changed from last year, but somehow she still convinced us to try it every year, and I was still not like it every year. Except now, I do like eggnog with whiskey and some fresh nutmeg grated on top. Hey, um, and she would try to convince us to go to these cemeteries at night. She would try <laughs> to make us watch scary movies, and I'm like, no, Courtney, I don't want to pee the bed or get nightmares. 
Um, so that, so I have not seen any of the American horror, uh, shows or series, but it totally makes sense because Nola has a lot of, uh, ghost stories and haunting stories, probably because of its slavery past. Um, and so, so you were saying you went there for your birthday. So that, so the first time you went there with Jamie was April of 2019. Yes. Okay. That's right. Yep. Um, and we, oh my gosh, I felt the energy as soon as I got off the airplane. I just like, there's something in the air. There's just like, yeah. that city just vibrates. And I, as soon as I was there, I was like, okay, this is my place. I love that. And we just, I remember the first time I was just like in awe. We took a, a an Uber from the airport, you know, to where we were staying. And I was just like, had my head just spinning, just looking at, it's so different. Just yeah. um, agriculturally and um, architecture is so different. Uh, I just remember just being enamored by it. Um, and then we started exploring the music and the food and just all of it was just so so incredible to me. We just had the best time. We had, we did, um, swamp tours and, um, ghost tours and got just in, in, immersed ourselves in the culture. And I just had such a great time and yeah. such a great time that we had decided to go back the following month. So we went in April and then we went again at the end of May to celebrate her now fiance's birthday because he oh, didn't wow. go wanted to go so we went the following month and then when I went the third time was when you were there as well for Halloween that same year so I had went three times that one year oh yeah so the first trip was a girl's trip and then the second trip you third wheeled with Jamie and her partner and then when I went you were there with your ex and so I was the third wheel yeah. Um, oh, so that's pretty cool. You guys went on a girl's trip and then you guys each went with your respective partners plus a third wheel. <laughs> right. And by then, by, by Halloween, I had decided, I said, this is this, I need to explore this further. Like this is, yeah. there's a calling here. I just need to, I need to pick up and I need to listen and I need to go. And I had then decided to go back to school um, and that I was moving down there um, to start my career in hospitality. I had decided that by, by Halloween. So Halloween was another way for me to kind of get my foot in the door and see the college and make mm -hmm. sure that like, this is really what I wanted to do before I actually moved the following year. So how did you decide on hospitality? Cause it's, it's quite different from mental health. <laughs> yes and no. Um, okay. It's more related than I think. Than okay. I, than I it was <laughs> just w when it comes to, the performance, I suppose, and making people feel a certain type of way. I feel like there's a lot, a lot of psychology and a lot of reading the room that comes with that. Okay. So I do think that those skills translated well. Um, Good. Yeah. But basically, um, the feeling that New Orleans gave to me was what I wanted to generate and, and inspire other people. In oh, I love that. Yeah, because I really felt it. Because you know, you know, you go down there, everybody's how you doing, my love? How can I help you? What can I get for you? And I was just like, I want, you guys made me feel so good. I want to make people feel like that. So that's why I, I went into hospitality. I knew I didn't want to do restaurants because that whole, that whole lifestyle intimidates the hell out of me. Like restaurants mm -hmm. scares me, but I wanted, um, I, I knew I wanted to be in hotels. Okay. Yeah. And that's a that's a big decision for anyone to go back to school, right? Because you were already out of school, like you said, you were working in um, mental health for five six years, and not just that, but you're moving out of Oregon for the first time, and not even to like Washington or California, which I call the uh, like the training wheel states because right. we're, we're just right next door. But you went really far all the way to Louisiana. Um, you know, pretty much across the U.S. and is is so different geographically, um, culturally. Um, so how was that move? And and I, I know you're also super close to your mom and your family. Um, so tell us a little bit on how that move was for you um, and how, uh, how did your mom take it? Because <laughs> yeah. you her yeah. baby and her best friend oh great question and 
it, don't get me wrong. It was hard. And I think it was hard because, um, seeing how it inf- affected both my parents, uh, particularly my mom, because we were so close and had that relationship, seeing how devastated she was to not be so close to me. was hard for me, for me. And this may sound selfish, but I was just, I knew that that's where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't fight that pull that it wasn't, it just, despite being away from my family, um, I just needed to be there. And I think once my, once my parents saw that, they knew too, that, that this is what she needs. You know, it's going to be hard. She'll be back. They knew that I would come back. And I had told everybody, you know, that this is temporary. I'm not going to move down here permanently. Um, although I almost did. <laughs> we can get to that, but I, yeah. I, I had a, I had a breakdown in the middle of the, uh, Jackson square one night and I was calling my mom and I was just like, mom, I just, I don't want to go home. And she sort of gave me permission, but then took it back <laughs> a couple days later. I was like, it wasn't permission to stay, but I know she was, she was also struck by fighting with that as well. Yeah. Like wanting me to be happy, but also mm-hmm. not wanting me to be as far away as I was. Yeah. Um, and during this time you were still in a relationship with your then partner as well. So you were in a long distance relationship at that time. And how did that, how did the distance affect, um, your, your relationship? Cause I well, know a lot of people yeah. who start, um, who start long distance and then either it doesn't work out, they fizzle out or, you know, they'll, they'll eventually close up the, the distance. Um, I think your instance is, is one of the only instances that I know that where, you know, you guys were living together, doing the whole very normal relation, long, long-term serious relationship deal. And then you said, no, I'm going to pursue, you know, my passion and my calling, but I still want to be in this relationship. So I just, um, I'm very curious on how you were able to take that leap. Cause I know my little bitch ass would not be able to do that. I'm like, no, I'm going to, I need someone cuddle me. Um, so how were you able to take that leap and how did, you know, your partner take it and, and the, cause obviously dynamics going to change with, for, from living together versus what, 2000 miles away. Yeah, of course. No. And, uh, whew. As, just whatever lot. you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, just no, no. just whatever you're comfortable sharing. Because I know more uh, of the story. Um, but you know, I think you sharing this part of the story is, is definitely gonna resonate with some people. And I really hope that, you know, you sharing this story is gonna encourage more young women to pursue themselves outside of relationships, even if you are in a relationship, because I've never been in that situation. I've, you know, whatever I pursued was during my singledom. Um and I know when I'm in a relationship, I'm needy as fuck and I'm not going to just up and leave because because I, 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 just, I just know I'm not strong enough for that. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to unpack there. And um, my situation is unique and that I don't I, I think there was part of me that really did think that I could come back and morph back into the life that I had because it was comfortable. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't unhappy. I wouldn't say per se, I wasn't like, you know, in hindsight though, I think I was unhappy. I just didn't, I, I don't know that I had fully admitted that to myself. Yeah. So this was sort of, I guess the only way to put it, it was, this is sort of my like sabbatical from reality <laughs> <laughs> uh, to really like kind of explore where that line was and what I was comfortable with and what I really wanted. Um, I wish I would, would have figured that out sooner. And I wish I would have been a lot more honest with myself as well as my partner about, you know, what that looked like for me. Yeah. Um, it was sort of a classic having your cake and eating it too, I think. Um, Cause I very much believe that, you know, I wouldn't be held accountable for anything that I, my behavior when, when I was away, like it didn't count what I was doing 
didn't count um, yeah. because nobody knew about it because I was the only one that was there. Yeah. Um, which is really <laughs> delusional in a lot of ways, <laughs> you know, um, it, it all worked out the way it was supposed to, I think, mm -hmm. but I think, I genuinely think that there was a part of me that wanted to believe that I could make up my own narrative, um, that I could have both. I, I don't think that's delusional at all. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I always joke around that because uh, I've done some solo traveling. I've always joked around that what happens abroad stays abroad, calories consumed abroad stays <laughs> abroad, and that shit is just not true. Um, and, you know, I, I think you lived out the college experience in NOLA that you didn't get to live out in college in your early 20s so you did it in your late 20s and because maybe you were in your in your late 20s versus early 20s there I don't know about you but you know I don't know if there was like a certain like if, if society saw it differently because if I see you know 20 the freshly 20 year old some girls going out and getting you know drunk and and living her best life YOLO, cool. But if I see some, you know, 50, 60 year olds still in the club, <laughs> like girls night popping bottles, I'm like, uh, don't like, like really? Like, don't you have I'm, responsibilities? Yeah. Like, <laughs> is this really what you want to do on a Friday night? Cause I'm 30 and I don't want to do that on a Friday night. Like I'm exhausted. I, I partied really hard in my twenties. Right. I'm not even going to lie. I'm not going to front. Yeah. So, so I, I don't, um, I don't think you're delusional for doing that. And I don't think, you know, you're, you're crazy or, or, you know, whatever I know. So I will also like to take this time to apologize again for what I said to you in the group chat, uh, for reference, oh. I did say some fucked up things to Courtney in the group chat. There's really no excuse or, or reasoning behind it. I, I can't even recall what was going on that day, but um, whatever was going on, that doesn't excuse what I said. And I genuinely want to let you know that I don't think anything you did in NOLA is, is a reflection of who you are as a character or whatever, or, or if I, I think a certain way of you, like you're always going to be that sweet 13 year old girl who let me sit with you guys during lunch, mm -hmm. who invited me to, you, you know, your, to the very first American Christmas. Cause you knew like. I wasn't doing anything like my parents weren't going to be doing anything. Um, so, you know, I, I, I genuinely want to, you know, let you know that Courtney. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And I think that Nola was, I think it really grew you. Um, I think it matured you and I think it wisened you. And like you said, I think for the first time you, you're thinking about what you want and what you need both career wise and relationship wise um because and correct me if i'm wrong because i think when you're 17 and in a relationship especially for that long you're kind of like well i'm not unhappy like you said he doesn't beat me he doesn't yell at me he's still you know we don't fight but at the same time it's it's also pretty stagnant right like He's not proposing. You guys are not, you know, raising children. It's kind of like, okay, what are we doing? Are we going to progress in our career? I'm not unhappy or progress in a relationship. It's like, I'm not unhappy, but at the same time, like nobody wants to be stagnant water. Right. Um, so and, I, and it's so cheesy, but I, I, I think about this line in a movie. Um, you, are, you're familiar with the holiday, right? I'm not. No, you don't know the holiday. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there's sort of a storyline that is um, like an old Hollywood director. Anyway, he, he says this to one of the main characters in the movie. He says, you're, um, you're not acting like the leading lady of your own life. Oh. You're acting like the best friend or, you know, and, and. It's something to that effect. Oh, that's and powerful. It is. It is. And I have realized that I had been, I had become like a secondary person in my own story because oh I goodness. was so passive in, you know, my early years. Like I didn't know really what I wanted or what direction I wanted to go. So I just sort of 
let my partner lead. And yeah, it wasn't until I realized like, wait a minute, I, you only get one of these. Yeah. I get to live this how I want to and explore how I, how, how I want to live and what I want to do and who I really want to be. And being away, I'm sure you can speak to this too. You get to develop all of that individually and you get to pick yes. and choose what you get to share with people and what sides they get to see and like how deep you want to go because they don't know you and yep. people you grew up with aren't there. So I really got to kind of develop, you know, my personality. <laughs> it seems kind of arbitrary to say that, but like, that's what happened. No, but I, I don't think it's arbitrary. I think you're you're absolutely right. It gives you a chance to grow because you you have to. You don't know anybody there, <clears throat> and um, you know you could call your mom, at, but at the same time she can't just drive over to Jackson Square and save you right then and there. You know right. she could give you that pep talk, but you had to pick yourself up from that spot, go to wherever you were residing at that time, and figure out your own shit. Um, and sometimes in very dangerous situations, <laughs> including natural disasters, like Hurricane Ida, my, my parents were terrified yeah. that I was going to get swept up in this hurricane. And you, yeah, so during Hurricane Ida, you were interning, um, that was near the end of your program, and you were interning uh, at a hotel, right? <clears throat> yes, I, at that time, was I only at the hotel? No, I was at both. So I had two jobs. Okay. I was working at Starbucks in the hotel, um, at, uh, in, on Canal Street, the Sheraton Hotel on Canal Street. And then also I was working nights, uh, at the House of Blues doing concerts. Um, and during Hurricane Ida, I was still employed, um, at Starbucks and they allowed me to stay in the hotel for about two weeks, um, after the storm while everything was recovering. So... I, you know, I was safe. I felt safe. The night of, my folks were really nervous. My dad wanted me to um, go stay with a family friend in Houston um, and was really upset that I had made the decision to stay. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, that was difficult. Because um, I was trying to be sensitive to his feelings. You know, I know he was scared. <clears throat> um, but I also knew that I was going to be okay. It's not like I was at a shelter somewhere in, you know, really unsafe circum you know, I was at a really nice hotel. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm glad you survived <laughs> Ida and, and lived to tell the tale. And yeah. you know, Sam might be mad at me for this one, but I'm glad you stayed. You you trusted your own gut. You trusted um you knew the the environment, you know, you were much closer to what is actually going on than your dad in Oregon and you 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 made your own decision and I think that's um it's not an easy decision especially when it's kind of a potential life or death situation like that so I do want to commend you on on making that decision to stay um uh, sorry Sam love you <laughs> <laughs> thank you I almost didn't I almost, that was the only time um uh, and it was funny it was the aftermath it wasn't during the storm but it was sort of like a week after because it was about the same time um that the garbage company went on strike and Ooh. so nobody was picking up our garbage oh no for a natural disaster oh so no the, the city the city that's already dirty was 10 oh, times shit. dirtier and just like there was trash everywhere stuff was still damaged and ruined in the street oh, and just walking through that and being like feeling discouraged and being like why am yeah. i still here i actually had a plane ticket and i was gonna I was going to revisit school another time. I was like, I'm not going to finish too much has happened. It was during COVID. So COVID yeah. storm after storm after storm yeah. hurricane Ida was like, okay, well this obviously isn't, I'm not going to complete this, but I ended up staying. But you stayed, you I finished, stayed. <laughs> you got your degree. Woo! Um, super proud of you for that. Cause I know you also went through some roommate bullshit out there. Um, you, you, Good. you definitely experienced <laughs> quite a bit of adversity, like natural disasters. That's, that's not anything, you know, you and I can, can control, but I also know that, you know, you went through some roommate experiences, which, um, you know, you've never had to cause your only roommate was, was a boyfriend. Um, right. so that was this, yeah. So despite all that, you know, to, to, 
um, what is it to to persevere through all that and get your degree? I'm I'm super proud of you. Even just taking the leap of faith to go back to school and and you know, like I said before, to move across the country um, is is not easy. And and I give you props. And then thank you. Um, let's, thank you. Let's bring your story back to Oregon. So post Nola, <laughs> got your degree. Um, and you know, you kept your word to your family and friends that you would come back to Oregon. Um, how was that? Cause I know you really, really love the city and Courtney's always been a, a music geek too. Um, my first concert was also with Courtney first time mosh pitting, first time crowd surfing, um, going to warp tour. So I've, I, I would not have had the childhood that I did without you a hundred percent. Um, you and, and your mom, shout out to Karen, who's the real, real MVP for driving us out there and being the coolest chaperone and, and just, yeah, being such a trooper. <laughs> yeah. Those late nights. Oh, were, you, man. were you there the night that we got towed? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Was... One concert we got towed and yeah, that was a shit show. Heart parking lot at the Hawthorne theater and they yes them. yes and, sh and your that. mom's like I got three teenage girls with me it's two o'clock what the fuck do you want me to do <laughs> she's like there's nobody fucking here why did you tow my fucking car I was like oh oh, oh. yeah yeah no that was uh... yeah I, I did I came back met the love of my life Love that. <laughs> Big reason why I stayed. Um, Cause had, had I, had I not met him, I, I may have considered returning to the swamp. Yeah. So, cause it, it was, it was hard. I remember, I remember the drive back. Cause I actually rode with his family um, back from Louisiana to Oregon in a car. Your exes. My exes family. Okay. And I, I remember not even having the energy to pretend to have like a fun road trip. I just remember being sad. I just remember sitting like laying in the back and just crying because I was leaving my favorite place. Um, and I s probably, if I would have been honest with myself then is when I probably started to really kind of shut down mm -hmm. um, and realize that like my relationship wasn't working and <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to fake, you know, that the, yeah. that person I had become was not the same person that I was. Yeah. Um, but it, that drive was, I remember that drive being really difficult for me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sad to hear how difficult that, that drive and that move back, um, was for you. And I know, you know, when you first came back, you you were working at a hotel, but it was also not what you expected, right? That I yes, I had applied for a um, a position with a little bit more responsibility. I had sort of thought that you know having an advanced degree would put me in the runnings of having more responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't think so. They thought they the term was that I was too green. Mm -hmm. um, right after college to be, to have, uh, that responsibility. So I was like, okay, I, I respect that. And you're probably right. I didn't grow up, you know, in this industry. Um, but I learned a lot from, from being at the front desk and, um, being a concierge is, is what, where I started. Um, and you really have to be in those roles, I think, or actually spend some time in those roles to understand mm -hmm. the pressures that come along with that and the performance element of it in front of guests. Um, because it's easy just to have that mindset when you're um, on the receiving end of it. Like I was explaining, that passion that right. came for, for hospitality was when I was on vacation. Um, but delivering that kind of feeling every single day when you're not on vacation is a completely yeah. different experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from, from that role and working um, in an elevated service. Um, where the expectation was really high. So, you know, my parents have only owned motels. We, I've never worked in a more 
high-end um, hotel and stuff. But the hotel you, you worked at was kind of like a boutique hotel. Um, and you are currently at a different hotel now as a manager, right? Yes. I yes. Mean, so, oh, it. <laughs> yes. So definitely a big congrats um, to you on that because I know that's a, a role you've been wanting and a role that you've been trying to work with your previous hotel, which, you know, they, they didn't want to budge on. Um, so tell us a little bit how you got this uh, new job and what your current role is now. So before uh, my role was uh, essentially front desk supervisor, it was a little bit something, but basically that's what I, that was what I was doing was supervising the front desk um, slash concierge because I was also helping to plan vacations and whatnot. Um, I, that hotel was lovely. Um, very eager, very new. They'd only been, they've only been around for about five years. So they still had that new business energy where they were really, and they're getting a lot of, um, a lot of the hype, um, well-deserved hype. But I, like you said, I was, you know, kind of gunning for what my, my education had, um, had shown me, you know, what I could be doing in terms of responsibility, um, as a hotel manager, I wanted, I wanted a team. I wanted to work with a team and I wanted to cultivate that kind of atmosphere at the time, Jimmy and I were watching a lot of Ted Lasso <laughs> and I was really like inspired by the, the leadership elements of what uh, being a manager would be like. So I get to try that out in my new role as hotel manager, which is awesome. Um, and I'm working for a chain now. Um, it's still a, it's a local chain. It's a Pacific Northwest based chain but they do have a lot more of um, guidelines of, you know, behavior and, and corporate of, you know, how things should be ran, what the idea is versus um, a very early business that is making, sort of making it up as they go. Nice. And uh, so, how long, it, how long have you been in this new role? Um, I th almost three months. Okay. How, so, um, how early. are you liking it? I like it. I've, you know, every, every job has challenges. Um, I've had some unique ones recently because, uh, I've kind of been forced to be a decision maker before I was really, I felt like before I was really ready because our general manager, um, was out for like a month and a half. Okay. So they, people were looking to me to make decisions and we had lost, um, a bunch of staff all at once. So I sort of became like the person that had to just kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a lot of growth there, uh, which is good. Uh, so you mentioned the general manager was out. So what is your official, uh, title at this place? So there is a, um, a hotel and a pub. Okay. Um, and so the general manager oversees both the hotel and pub. I don't oversee any of the pub, just the hotel. Oh, okay. Okay. As I mentioned before, restaurants intimidate me. <laughs> I'm marrying a chef, so I know what that world looks like, and I see that stress, and I'm not, I know that I'm not cut out for that. So hotels is where I want to stay. <laughs> well, maybe not yet, but, you know, uh, restaurants is still very much so part of the hospitality industry, and I, I, I do not want to put any ceilings on your career, and I hope you don't either. <laughs> I know you love the, the, the hotel industry, but, you know, I think you are as – smart as you are kind and beautiful and so if you know later on down there is the opportunity for you to be a general manager and part of that includes overseeing the restaurant I hope that you don't cut yourself short because I think you are more than able um and and yeah maybe uh you know that is something that could be in the future as you know, just because something's intimidating, I don't think it should be avoided. Um, so yeah, so, so be confident. It could be intimidating, but um, like I said, I think you are, I think you're capable. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. if anybody a good example, it's you. Um, <laughs> the lawyer and bodybuilder of the group. Oh, man. <laughs> Ambitious as fuck. <laughs> you know, I, I um, it's, it's, it's very flattering, um, you know, ex 
hearing that from ex- especially from you right because we just started as as friends we're just kids um but i i don't i think when you're in it you don't really see the growth and like for me it's kind of like oh yeah you know i went to law school you know none of my law school friends are like oh my god you're a lawyer it's so cool because we're all lawyers you're in the community you know you're in the sauce just like my bodybuilding friends aren't like, oh my God, you're so jacked. If, if anything, like I got people roasting me like, ah, little baby delts. I remember when I started lifting yesterday because, you know, I'm still a very new to this sport, very new to even being an athlete. You knew my ass didn't, didn't do nothing <laughs> in high school. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun, isn't it? It's really cool to yeah. have friends doing like badass things and yeah. supporting. Like I, I've always been a big fan of yours and seeing oh. your yeah, thank you. It's been really neat to see that growth and you know, in your platform. And sorry, I lost you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's. <laughs> I am cracking up right now because Courtney's <laughs> trying to like set her phone to to her, but it just keeps flopping over, and it's just so funny. It's, um... <laughs> No, yeah, it's it's cool. It's cool when you can brag on your friends, you know. Yes. It's, I it's, love bragging on my friends. Like if if you don't have friends you can brag about that you're doing something wrong. Like that's yeah. what I personally think. Um and that's one reason why I wanted to start this podcast is the older I get and you know, when you look further than than just the the physical person in front of you everybody has a story and hardships that they went through um and you don't have to be rich or famous like literally everyday people the, the people closest to you have some pretty incredible stories and you know i i definitely think you have a very unique story a and something that um you know could probably help a lot of young girls and we haven't even dug deep into to your your relationship because I mean, we can briefly touch on it. Like you said, you know, you were in this long-term 12-year relationship and then you came back and met the lover of your life pretty quickly. Um, and I think it also goes to show like everything happens for a reason, right? Because you, uh, I'm going to spill the beans. They met at work and at the first job where Courtney was not given the um, role and responsibility and compensation we should always talk about money because that's very important where she was not given that, you know, like as someone with a graduate degree, even if they were paying her hourly and, and giving her a different role, like I genuinely think that hourly amount should have been higher. And I've expressed this to you, but again, I don't want to put on my lawyer hat right now. I'm a podcast host right now. <laughs> I'm about did to get I, heated. Did I even tell you? Did I even tell you? I didn't even know my salary. Yes. Until, like, yes. Yes. Work. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then I was very mad at you for not reading the fine print, for not negotiating with them and for taking their verbal promises and not putting it in writing. Because we've, we've yeah. had this conversation and I was I very upset with you. <laughs> but again, yeah. I think everything works out for a reason, right? Because if you you were a stickler like me and needed everything in writing and, and everything to, to be perfect before you started the job, then you would not have met your now fiance. Um, so, um, so again, I think everything happens for a reason and, um, yeah, well, and just, just going back to, I, I know I'm kind of jumping around, but, um, talking about just like being an advocate for your friends, um, I'd be lying if I didn't say that you were a lot of the inspiration for like the solo travel. Oh, like even though we're still in tears. the United States and you've gone like all these incredible places, you know, different countries and stuff. Like it takes a lot of balls to just like get up and go somewhere you've never been. Yeah. And I was like, Thank I you. think it's pretty incredible that Julia has been all these amazing places. Like I can at least go explore another, you know, <laughs> part of the United States. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm so glad to hear that. You know, I just I do the things I do because I enjoy it and I want to do them. But if I can even inspire or motivate one person along the way, then that is, you know, a, a cherry on top. So I'm so glad to hear that. And I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, you found 
uh, inspiration in my travels to, to travel to New Orleans. And even though it's still within the U.S., I definitely think NOLA is one of the most unique U.S. cities, right? Because Louisiana is already unique. It's It's got so much Frenchness to it and then yeah. and then Great. nola itself is also super unique in, in louisiana it's like its own little thing in in louisiana so um even though it's within the u.s it's definitely a whole new culture and um you know for you to make the commitment to move out there that's very you know commendable and i i hope more girls who listen to this podcast and listen to your story will be inspired to do the same and find the um the courage within themselves to do it um but yes you don't have to stay in your hometown you can <laughs> say go. it louder girl say it louder <laughs> You can always come back. Don't get me wrong. Yes. Home will always be home. You can always come back. But yes. just go, go get a different perspective. There's so many people, even just that I interact with, that I just, I'm like, you've only been here. Yep. Go, go, go explore. Yes. Go learn a different mentality, a way of thinking, a different lifestyle. Just try it out. You don't have to commit to it. Just try it out. Yes. Um. So, you know, I know your time is valuable and, you know, you work a lot, so I don't want to take up too much of your off time. But before we get off, um, what advice would you have for people who want to either go back to school or pursue a career change, um, you know, in their late 20s or, or any age? I know it's scary um, financially and otherwise, like you're, you've already committed to one pathway, you know, and, and invested time and money, um, into one pathway. Yeah. But if you're not doing what you want to do, it's okay to, it's okay to change it. Like it's okay to try new things. It's okay. You can, you can always come back too. like your degrees don't go away. It's never a bad thing to continue learning. Always, always, always seek out knowledge. And if that's, includes you know the education system by all means if that includes you know a creative pathway explore that um you can always go back um don't let that intimidate you just i love keep that learning. keep learning always keep learning learn from your friends <laughs> i love that yeah you know like she said just go for it and your degrees will will always be there and your past work experiences don't uh dissipate when you choose a different career they're still there and like no, what you no. were saying there's a lot of transferable skills that you wouldn't even have thought of absolutely right? working with people will always be transferable um yes. in my situation like the skills that i learned about how to read people um definitely translate to the hospitality world Awesome. Well, is there anything else you want to share with the listeners before we get off? I hope, I just hope I didn't do anything too annoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't, I don't think so. And if, okay. <laughs> if they're annoyed, they can turn this shit off. Okay. We're not forcing <laughs> them to watch us or listen to us. Okay. So if you're fucking annoyed, don't, don't leave some bullshit in the comments. Just turn us off. My God like <laughs> keep... it's okay if you do i probably won't read it anyway <laughs> yeah um and then last but not least um i don't know if you want people to find you but if people want to find you um where can they find you <laughs> yeah i'm not super present um online but my handle on instagram is uh from 503 to 504 um, which is the New Orleans zip code 504 um, and the McMinnville zip code 503. So that's the explanation of my tag. But <laughs> that's you can find me on Instagram. I only have Instagram. And then where can they find you professionally um, if they're ever in the Oregon or Willamette area? Um... Oh, yeah. Come stay at Hotel Oregon. My... Uh, family company or parent company, I guess you could say is the, uh, McMinniman's chain. Um, and the hotel that I manage is in McMinnville called hotel Oregon. Sounds good. And then I we will also say what say it again. We have, we have ghosts. Come see us if you're ghost hunters. 
<laughs> okay, so yeah, so stay with them if uh, you're into ghost hunting, ghost stuff. Um, and if you're like me, there are also other non-ghosty hotels in McMinnville. But I will put Courtney's Instagram in the description below as well as her hotel and her professional contact information. So if you're ever in McMinnville or the Willamette Valley, definitely go um, go hit up my girl. She will. She's Oregon born and raised, so she knows the area very well and will be able to help you out. Um, but thank you so much, Courtney, for your time and for your candidness, your transparency um, in this conversation. And uh, we got to FaceTime more. We can't just we can't just have conversations for podcasts. We got to like connect more and, and stay in touch because I think it's very rare to have friendships from way back in, in middle school. And, you know, we've, uh, we, you know, drifted apart, came back together and, you know, it's kind of like the waves that ebbs and flows, but I definitely want to keep you closer than further. Um, and if I'm ever in Oregon, I will definitely hit you up. And then if, you ever have any time and you and your partner ever have any time want to come down and vacay in san diego you guys always always have a home here um it's not a very big home but it is a roof <laughs> <laughs> thank so, you appreciate yeah. that thank you. i love you so much and we will connect you. more <laughs> yes um yeah well and thank you everybody for listening and that is a wrap bye guys